Hi, this is Kerry Kautzer. I'm here reporting at Road America for the Vintage Weekend with Brian Andrews. I'm in an XK150 Jaguar, one of the major sponsors. And we're going to take you around the track with interviews and racing footage, so enjoy the program. Thank you. Okay, we're here at Tony De Lorenza and Bob Serna, uh, racing at the Vintage Weekend here at Road America. Uh, Tony, can you talk about the car that you're uh, racing in? Well, it's a, a Reventlo Scarab. It's basically a tube chassis, aluminum-bodied uh, Roadster. It's got a Chevrolet V8 in it, 300 and... 500 and some horsepower? No, yeah, 500 and some horsepower, 356 cubic inches, and uh, mechanical fuel injection. Um, it's, uh, this car was built 25 years after the original three front engine cars were built by uh, Lance Ravenlo's brother. And uh, Bob and I are college buddies and uh, I, uh, I wasted my life driving race cars and he was busy working so now that he's in the vintage business he asked me to drive the Scarab and it's an honor to do it and it's a beautiful car and it runs extremely fast for being having only six inch wide tires on it so it's a lot of fun and uh, you've raced here at road america before yeah i, I raced in uh scca nationals what and your first time tony what was your first year 68 uh, 1967 uh, i ran the june sprints uh, i won the june sprints here in 1968 1969 and uh came back here and ran in the trans am several times and uh we ran uh uh, SCCA Nationals and FIA Long Distance Races and uh, uh, Trans Am Series and IMSA GT uh, Pro Races and uh, I think I did it for a living for about six years so I had a good time and being able to drive in a vintage car is like the old saying Yogi says deja vu all over again so it's a lot of fun. Hey Bob uh, you want to talk about your car? Yeah I'm uh, driving a uh, 52 Mercedes-Benz prototype race car. The factory made 10 of these race cars for the 52 season. They made them from their parts bin from their sedans. The engine in this car is an original one of five in the world, 52 racing engine, serial number 21. The car is a recreation of the car that John Fitch drove for the Pan American Carrera in 1952 in Mexico. I had the privilege of buying this project about one third finished and it's essentially a faithful reproduction from blueprints, drawings and photographs of the original works race car from 1952 using an original works racing engine the only one that's not in the mercedes museum by the way and it is essentially a 1955 gullwing drivetrain which is essentially the same as the 52 racing season all the parts are the same and it runs beautifully it has legs it doesn't like this short course here at, at road america it'd like another 10 miles straight it just gets moving as we come to the first turn and it's a wonderful car to drive, and it's uh, been a lot of fun. I've gotten to know a lot of good people. John Fitch has driven it for me. He's now 86 years old. We took it to Goodwood. We've taken it to Monterey, and this is my first time here at, uh, at uh, Road America with this car. We've been coming since 68, since 98 with the uh, Scarab. This is our sixth year with the Scarab, my first year here with this car. Great, uh, Tony, what do you think of the Road America track itself? Uh, it's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I came here in 67, and I've had a lot of good races here, and uh, it's, uh, it's very fast, uh, but there's some technical parts, too. Uh, the carousel, for one, the kink, which is very famous, coming out of there into Kettle Bottoms and into Canada Corner, but it's wide. There's a lot of places to pass. Uh, you got to have good brakes here because you, you use your brakes uh, real hard, three times a lap, and... Uh, uh, it's just, it's a great place, and the, the food is the best, and the oh, yeah. facilities, and for today, anyway, the weather is, you can't beat it. And we can't really beat Wisconsin hospitality. 
people here are just really great people. We've always had a good time. We've always been treated well in Wisconsin. And my cousin lives in Two Rivers. Oh, that's right, yes. <laughs> and the track's too short for you. Track's too short for this car. Anything else you'd like to add, gentlemen? Uh, just uh, we're having a great time, and uh, we're uh, just uh, happy to be here. Yeah. How often do you campaign these cars at other tracks? Uh, this is the first time this year for both cars. But typically, I'll race this one three or four times a year, Monterey, Coronado, uh, maybe here. Um, so typically, we do. I do three or four to five races a year, and we do one we do with a, a Scarab. We do one with a Scarab, but we usually do a test session uh, first, yes. and then we run the race weekend. So twice. Mayor Racing at Road America, and they have a, a nice uh, Formula A racing car that they restored. Uh, could you tell us about uh, the car? Bob, give me the history on that. Well, this particular car was uh, built in 1967 by Red Legrand in California. It was a prototype Formula A car right when the series was developed. This car ran the whole 68 Formula Continental Series, driven by Bruce Eglinton. Uh, it won the first Formula A race in the United States at Las Vegas, and then in the third race, Dan Posey went on to drive the car to no great success, but uh, it won the first race out of the box, and then that was the end of its career. It was destroyed in 69 in a testing accident. Hey, you want to tell us a little bit about the restoration work you did? Okay, the, uh, uh, the car was wrecked very severely in 1968. and went end for end several times. Uh, the works driver, Bruce Eglinton, was driving it. He, he was hurt, but he was all right. Uh, the car at that time was pretty much obsolete on the bro circuit. Uh, cars went away from the tube chassis into the monocoques, and this was obsolete. So it pretty much sat in Red Legrand's shop for several years, and it, it finally got traded uh, through a couple of hands, never got restored at all. We found the car in, in New York itself, and uh, it was basically a basket case then. It still had the mud in the wheels from Riverside Racetrack. We uh, started restoration of it. Everything was pretty much broken. There was not one corner that was uh, usable. We started straightening out all the parts to uh, make drawings of what they looked like. And about a third of the way into the drawings, we we had notified the Formula A registry that we were restoring the car. And uh, we got a call from a guy in Venezuela. He introduced himself as the vice president of General Motors Venezuela. He said, I'm going to send you something you're going to appreciate. And about a week later, we get this about five foot high tube in the mail and, and uh, rolled it out and there's one to one drawings of this car. The original drawn one to one, no dimensions, you need to make a part, you go up to the wall and measure it and build it. So uh, we pretty much built all the parts you see here that were broken. Uh, chassis was in great shape. Uh, we really had to do uh, make new uprights, uh, build new suspension, all made to the original drawings. We believe the car is very accurate to how it was when they first put it together. Uh, down we to have, the color. Down to the, the color. color it was in 1967. So. We have original construction pictures of it from Legrand's uh, shop, and 
we tried to follow those as accurately as we could. So it, it's a pretty good restoration of uh, antique history. And you were out of the track here? Yes, uh, we, we had three cars here. We uh, threw a rod, unfortunately, and uh, the motor is blown up. But, uh, on the Cheeto. On the, on the Cheeto over there. Uh, this one right here is going to the concourse this evening. So, uh, uh, And then the yellow Ford here, we, we've been running all weekend long with no problems yet. So. Okay, we also have your son here. Uh, what do you do on the crew? I just uh, help out with uh, whatever they tell me to do. <laughs> uh, polishing, you know, whatever is uh, needed to be done. Loading transporters up. And <laughs> Is your dad giving you an opportunity to drive the car? I, uh, you know, a few times putzing around, but uh, nothing major yet. He's just itching to go, though. Yeah. We, we need to get a couple more years under his belt before he's in the driver's school. And uh, he drives the cars around in the paddock, but we're going to put him on the track probably in two more years. So he still has to pay his dues on polishing. So. <laughs> Tell us about your transition from motorcycles to race cars. Motorcycles and cars, well, uh, I never imagined I would sort of be involved in cars, and in fact, I'd never seen any car races. I'd been totally involved in motorcycling from a time my uh, father took me along to one, the first event, in fact, which was held in England after the war. And uh, there he was competing with a motorcycle and sidecar at a place called Cadwell Park. Well, I went on and I obviously started motorcycling and I did the World Championship Series. And in uh, 1958, uh, which was just after the championship had been won by Mike Hawthorne, Mike, uh, Tony Vanderville, who had created the Van Wall car, and Reg Parnell, who was in fact team manager of Aston Martin, uh, the sports car team, uh, we were all sitting at the same table for a Sportsman of the Year contest. Uh, this was held in Park Lane in London. And the conversation got round. Mike was going to ride a motorcycle in, a, in, in the Pressman's trial on the coming weekend, and I was going to do likewise. And he said, have you ever thought of driving a car? Uh, I said, well, no, 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 never really thought about it. You know, I just race bikes, and that's what my first love is. He said, oh, you know, cars uh, stand up easier. So uh, I said, oh, well, no, no, no. With that, Reg Parnell turned around and said, I'll give you a drive. And Tony Vanderbilt turned around and said, no, you're a motorcyclist, I'm a motorcyclist, I'll give you a drive. So I said, no, no, no. But... Uh, things developed with my team, MV Augusta, whereby they wanted to cut me back into doing a very restricted program, purely world championship events, which meant that I'd only be doing perhaps 10 races a year. 
and I loved my racing. And when I was a, uh, work, riding for Nortons and riding privately as well, I was doing something like 76 races a year. So there's a little bit of a change. So I thought about it and uh, it coincided with Reg Parnell ringing up and saying, come down to, Ast uh, come down to um, Goodwood and try an Aston Martin. So why not? So I go off to Goodwood and I test the Aston Martin that Sterling Moss had won the thousand kilometers of the Nürburgring with. And this um, was a DBR1 Aston Martin, three litre sports car. And I went round and did about sort of 10, 15 laps, I think it was. And I came in and Red said, oh, John, stop for a moment, sign here, please. So I picked it up, I actually read it and said, what's this? He said, it's a contract. I said, no, 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 uh, you know, I'm, I'm still a motorcyclist. I can't contract to drive a car. Well, I get home and uh, there's a phone call. And in fact, it's Tony Vanderbilt on the phone. What the hell are you driving for that? And he made some rather disparaging remarks about David Brown, which I gathered they didn't get on very well. So he said, I will bring the van walls down. So David York, the team manager, turned up at Goodwood uh, next day uh, with a truck and three Van Wall Grand Prix cars. Well, I thought, well, it's interesting to look at because also, of course, he'd won the World Championship and then retired from racing with the cars, but they were built around the design of four Manx Norton engines, which, of course, I was well um, connected with. So I went out and I went round and round and round and he said, I'm coming out of retirement, I'm going to build you a new car. I said, no, no. But I'd done enough to think that there's nothing in my contract to stop me driving cars. So I went over to John Cooper and uh, said, I'd like to buy a motor car. I'm not going to drive for any work, so I'd buy a motor car. He said, buy a Formula 2. And so we agreed to buy a Formula 2 Coventry Climax engined um, Cooper for a total sum complete with wheels and gear ratios of £2,350. Perhaps a little discounted, but still, you just see the sort of cost of things then compared with now. Um, However, standing there was a rather tall gentleman I'd never seen before, who he introduced me to as Ken Till. And Ken Till said, um, you're driving for me at the Easter meeting in my Formula Junior car. I've spoken to the RAC. They're going to give you a license. If you perform satisfactory, they give you a full license so you can do anything. I said, oh, yes, thank you. It had all been put together, of course, by John Cooper uh, between uh, them. And so that's how, in fact, I got started. And I saw my first ever race, a car race, from the cockpit. And that day I had a bit of a dice with Jim Clark in the Works Lotus. Uh, in fact, I would have had him, except that I forgot on the last lap that I had two extra wheels. And I, <laughs> and I tried to go through a gap which was a bit too small and ended up using half a grass, but uh, he just pit me in that. The second race, uh, I in fact used my Cooper Formula 2. Dad was chief mechanic and van driver. We put the Formula 2 on the back of the van and went off to Alton Park and competed against the Works Lotus teams and the Works Cooper teams and uh, came second behind in his island in the Works Lotus. It was off then to Aintree the Aintree race course famous for the Grand National, Motor, uh, Grand National Horse Racing, uh, where there was a, a good road circuit. And this was an international Formula 2 race, and Porsches brought all their cars over. And they took the first three places, but I was the first British car and set a record lap in fourth place. Next thing is, Colin Chapman's on the phone, you're going to drive Formula 1. Are you? I said, yes, well, okay, I'll come and try Formula One. So I turn up at Goodwood, uh, sorry, turn up at Silverstone. And there's um, Colin Chapman. 
he'd been buzzing around in the car because Colin drove the cars and drove very quickly, rather like Uhlenhardt with the Mercedes cars. Uh, Colin, you know, was a good driver. And in his island had been going around. And he said, come on, you know, sit in here. It's a Lotus 18, Coventry Climax, two and a half litre Grand Prix car. So, uh, put whack, jumped into it. A little different to the van wall, which I'd driven before. And I went round and round and then uh, stuffed it in the bank at Stowe Corner. I thought, oh, I didn't get that quite right. And I got back and in his island let off with such a tyrant at me about bending their equipment, etc. But Colin Chapman turned around and said, I want you to join the team and drive in all the races when you're not motorcycling. So I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so um, that was it. I suddenly became a works driver for Lotus at the same time as I was a works driver for Envy Augusta. And, uh, I, at that time, was sort of, I suppose, a rising, you know, rising person and uh, been driving a Lola that I got from John Surtees. In, uh, got it in 67, but this was 68. And... Uh, and Ferrari called, and Fagari called. He said, can you come to Modena and test the Formula Due? And so I arrived, you know, and I went, and I tested, and at uh, lunchtime, Fagari took me on one side. He said, you see over there under the trees in the raincoat? I said, yes. He says, this is Commendatore. I said, oh. Well, this was for pressure, you know, from Ferrari. So I go, I try a little bit harder, and uh, it's okay. So now I'm going to race at the Nürburgring with team leader Jackie X uh, in the Dino. Poor and you. Hmm? Poor you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but before that, you know, in, the, in that weekend when I was testing at uh, Modena, I went to have lunch in the Ferrari headquarters, and I suppose there are 40 managers, you know, and executives there. And uh, uh, I think it was uh, Andrea Caleri takes me into this uh, glass door, and there at the far end of the room is... Enzo Ferrari with his lieutenants and as I come in he stands up and he's a very imposing figure you know he walks down to me and uh, one side at each side of him there was uh, Figari and Caleri and he stops in front of me and I sort of I'm not sure what to do you know I start to put my hand out to shake hands or something and he shoots his right hand out but high up and he gets hold of my cheek here like this and he shakes it and he says nice a boy <laughs> At this point, I was extremely worried and wasn't too sure whether I wanted to drive for Ferrari at all. But anyway, we get to the Nürburgring on the, uh, the Sudschleife, the South Circuit, which is still a difficult up and down through the trees circuit, but it's about six miles instead of 14 miles on the Nordschleife. Well, about uh, 10 minutes from the end of qualifying, I came in the pits because um, Fagari rushes up to me. Brian, Brian, he said, why you stop? Why you stop? I said, well, I've gone about as fast as I can. He said, Brian, he said, go out and try harder. You are in 10th place. So now I go and drive like a maniac. Uh, I go one tenth of a second faster. And I'd never been in 10th place. I'd been in 4th place. And so the race started. And there was Jackie Ix and uh, Piers Courage and Kurt Ahrens, German, who was an expert on the Nürburgring. And on about the fifth or sixth lap, I felt a tremendous blow in my eye here. And in those days, we used ex-World War II goggles, you know, with no strength in them at all. And a stone had gone through my goggle. And so I, I, I thought it had hit me in the eye, you know. I flung my hand up, flung my goggles off, slowed down and came to a halt and then blinked. And uh, this eye was, you know, teary and sore, but I could see. So I drive the rest of the way around. It was only just past the pits. So I go five miles, going fairly slowly. Get in the pits, for Gary leaps up and down. Where are your spare goggles? I said, I don't have any. So he throws me Ix's spare goggles, which were sun goggles with the green lens. And now I go out and I drive like a madman and uh, set a new lap record and finish fourth. But when I go back in the hotel, I sat on the bed and I was not uh, happy. And at dinner that night, Fagari came to me and said, Brian, he said, I have spoken with Signor Ferrari, and for the rest of the year, you drive a Formula Due, and in September, Formula Uno. 
And I said, no, thank you. And he said, no, thank you. What do you mean, no, thank you? I said, if I drive for Ferrari, I said, I'll be dead by the end of the year. So that was that. <laughs>
All right, we're here with Dave Swigler. Uh, Dave, you want to tell us about your car that you have here at uh, the Vintage Weekend? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, this car is a uh, Surtees TS8 Formula 5000 car, which was uh, built in 1971. Uh, Team Surtees sent it over from England for Peter Revson to drive at the uh, Questar Grand Prix out at Riverside, California. Then it went back to England and it was raced over there for several years. Uh, has there been any uh, restoration work done on it? It was semi-restored when I got it. I bought it from Brian Redmond back in the mid-80s, and then I've uh, upgraded it and uh, done some of the paint work since then. So I've, it's been a gradual work of uh, love over time. Uh, what other tracks have you campaigned this car at? We've been to uh, Road Atlanta, uh, Mid-Ohio, Watkins Glen, and this is our first time up here at, uh, at this track. And what, what do you think of the Road America track? I'm still trying to learn it. Four miles of, uh, with 14 plus turns is unbelievable. It's a great track, though. I wish I could spend more time up here. All right. Uh, anything uh, you'd like to add? Well, I guess the one uh, claim to fame of this car, it won the Monza uh, Formula 5000 race in 1972 with Alan Rollinson. And that was the fastest Formula 5000 race ever run. And uh, that's probably the high point for this car in 72.
We're here with David Coward, uh, owner of the uh, John Surtees uh, Lola T70. Uh, David, could you tell us a little bit about the car? Well, it was uh, one of two cars that John Surtees used in 1966 when he won the uh, Can-Am Championship. And it went to another racer after that. It sat for a number of years. I acquired the car in uh, 1977 and have raced it in vintage events myself and uh, have just thoroughly enjoyed the car. It's, it's very, very fast, uh, even for today, by today's standards. Uh, do you have to do any restoring to it? Yes, it's been an ongoing project, uh, mechanically as well as uh, cosmetically, but it is a uh, very accurate uh, representation of the car as it was raised in 1966. You know, have, uh, have you yourself been here at Road America? Oh yes, I've raced here many times starting in the uh, late 70s in the IMSA series and I raced here actively annually until about 1988 and then from that point on it's been in vintage racing both with this car as well as several others. You had a chance to talk to John Sturdy's uh, this morning, uh, what were some of the things you talked about? Oh yes, well, sort of reminiscing about uh, the car back then and uh, what all he went through and he talked about the modifications he's made to the car after it came from the Lola factory and those modifications are still on the car today. So it's, uh, it was quite an experience in listening to him reminisce about the car. All right, uh, is the tra uh, car going to have any uh, track time this weekend? Uh, it has developed a severe vibration, and rather than continue to push the car, I think we'll just uh, make a static display out of it for the rest of this weekend until we can get it home and diagnose the problem. Okay, thank you. Ready. Yeah. Well, uh, I think 
have uh, David Meek, owner of the XK150 1960 Jaguar. Can you tell us about your car? Sure. Uh, I've owned it about four years. Uh, we bought it from a widow in Minneapolis who uh, husband she met on a cruise in Greece when she was 18. Uh, he wanted to impress her parents, and so he bought it off a lot in Virginia, drove it up to Canada, and asked for her hand in marriage. And uh, they were married uh, many years. Uh, they owned it 38 years, and we bought it about four years ago. It's uh, completely original. I had 58,000 miles on it when we bought it. And uh, it's still unrestored, and we've been enjoying it each summer ever since. Well, we took it on the uh, Vintage Sports Car Rendezvous in Thunder Bay, uh, Ontario, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we usually do uh, about 15 to 20 vintage car events uh, over the course of the summer. And uh, last weekend we did a hill climb at a ski area outside of Minneapolis where they laid out a course and all the vintage cars made runs up the up the road going up the hill. It's a lot of fun. What makes this uh, Jaguar unique from other Jaguars? Uh, well, this car had the uh, uh, same engine that would come out in the E-Type. Uh, just a year and a half later, and they were uh, able to uh, test out the engine uh, on the S model, which was a special edition of this car. And uh, it's it's sporty, it's fun, and uh, to me, it kind of typifies the uh, Jaguar mark. One last question: Where are you from, and uh, what do you think of Road America? <laughs> I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and. This is the best racetrack in the country. I've uh, uh, been here several times and uh, make it now an annual uh, pilgrimage here. Love the area, love Elkhart Lake. We stay in Plymouth and, uh, you know, great towns, great atmosphere and fun people.
right, that's our show for today. The Vintage Weekend at Road America. I'm here with Team Jaguar, and bye for now.